Okay. So welcome to the livestock webinar series. Um, I'm going to be talking about small ruminant pasture management tips tonight. Um, I'm mainly going to focus on um, pasture establishment um, and forage selection. But if you have any other type of pasture or grazing questions, feel free to ask me. Um, go ahead and put in the chat window. We'll do a Q&A at the end. Uh, so if, if it's not covered tonight and you've still got questions, you know, I'll be more than happy to have a discussion at the end of this webinar. So my name is Lauren Langley. I'm the livestock agent here in Alamance County. If you're not already currently working with your livestock extension agent where you are, I encourage you to reach out and get to know them. I'll be happy to connect you to the office um, if you send me an email. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited to, to be on tonight. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. This is gonna be recorded. Um, I will send out an email probably tomorrow morning with the recorded recording link, as well as some handouts and a really short evaluation, if you wouldn't mind completing that for me. Okay, so let's uh, start at the beginning. Anytime I give a pasture talk, I start with soil testing because you cannot man manage a pasture without knowing what's in the soil. Um, if you just guess, you know, um, you're, you're probably not gonna get it and you're more than likely gonna waste your time and money. So I always say don't guess, but soil test. <laughs> um, so if you don't have a current report, you need to do soil testing first before you do anything. Um, soil testing is free here in North Carolina the majority of the year. So it runs from like April 1st to uh, towards the end of November, it's free. The rest of the year, it is $4 a sample, which is still really inexpensive. And this is all done through the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Um, kind of talking about the procedure and how that works. Um, hold on one second. Okay, so make sure everybody is muted and has their video off um, as you come in. Uh, to the to the webinar here. Let me back up. Okay, um, so again, it's done through NCDA. Extension offices usually help implement this service. We have the forms and we have the boxes and we can help you interpret the results. Some extension offices will mail the samples off for you during the free period, but most of them you're going to have to mail your own sample through. Okay, so somebody said that they cannot hear me on my end. Okay, so I think that might just be M Michelle because on my end is showing that um, my microphone is on. Okay, if y'all just hang on one second. Okay. Um, okay, I'm sorry about that. That's the problem if I don't have a moderator, I've got to present and moderate. And so I apologize, there's probably gonna be some breaks throughout. But anyways, um, if you haven't done this before, it's really, really easy to do. Um, you want to have a clean plastic bucket. You of course wanna go ahead and get the form and the sample boxes from the extension office. If the extension office doesn't have a soil probe for you to check out, you can easily use a shovel or um, a trowel or something like that. It definitely helps if the soil has a little bit of moisture. Um, in the middle of summer, if it's dry, it's gonna be really hard to pull soil samples. You really wanna go four to six inches deep um, when you're doing these soil samples. So what I always suggest is that you do a box per permanent pastured area and no more than um, 10 acres at a time for a box because when you ever you go over 10 acres it's just so hard to represent that entire area um, so if you've got temporary fencing running everywhere I, again i would not try to soil sample every single little bitty sliver of land you have stripped up i would do it off of the perimeter area because it's going to be much easier to manage and amend the soil with lime or fertilizer for that area you want to zigzag around um, and take as many subsamples as you can stand. Obviously, the bigger the area, the more subsamples you need to take. 
I recommend at least one to two subsamples per acre that you're doing. Again, the more you do, the better, because it'll represent that entire area. So you zigzag around, take samples four to six inches deep, which is uh, what's going to be available to that plant. So that's why the, um, we're saying four to six inches deep. Way on the side of six inches versus four, if you can. Um, put it together in that clean plastic bucket, mix it up, and then you're gonna pull a representative sample to fill your box. You fill to that red line on the box and make sure that the soil is not really wet. If it is really wet, you wanna lay it out on a paper towel, let it dry for it goes in the box. Do not use plastic bags, tape, or anything on the box. They rip the top off, dump out the soil to test it, and then they um, recycle, and they don't want anything on those boxes. Um, for pastures, you want to soil sample every two to three years. For hayland, you want to probably do every year, um, or I'd say every one to two years, because you're trying to maximize production every single year and make as much hay as you can. With pastures, you want to match your pasture needs to your grazing needs. If you don't need a whole lot of grazing, then you do not want to add a lot of nitrogen, for example, and I'll get to that here in just a minute. Okay, so this is what the form looks like for ag use. There is, um, there is a form for lawn and gardens, so make sure you get the one that's for ag use because it's gonna give you the recommendation per acre, not per square foot. And vice versa, if you want a lawn or a garden sample, make sure that you get the one for square footage. Um, so whenever you complete this, you're gonna put all your information up here at the top um, and then fill out some of this other information over here, like sample day, your county, the number of samples. Um, and if you have a farm ID, that's fine. If you don't, don't worry about it. And then down here, you wanna give it a sample identification. I don't know, I've lost my mouse, there we go. Sample identification, so it could be front, it could be back, it could be zero, one. Make sure that you make a key for your farm because if you're doing 10 different pastures and you don't write down a key, it might be really hard for you to remember where things go when the results come back. The lime, um, if there's been lime applied within the past 12 months, that goes here. If not, leave it blank. First crop, second crop, this is really set up for field crops. So this is how you do it for pastures. First crop is what's growing there now, and the second crop is what you want to grow there. If it's the same thing, um, you put the same thing in both boxes. So if it's a fescue pasture, you want to remain a fescue pasture, you put it in both, um, you put it in both boxes. So my chat window's lighting up. Um, okay, it looks like everybody can hear now. Okay, good. Um, all right, so let me go to the next one here. So this is what the back of the form looks like. This is where you pull the codes from. So on that, on that front page, you know, you saw where it says code. Uh, you go to the back and it's got for forages and pastures. E stands for established, so this is important. If you are establishing a pasture from the ground up, from bare soil, your first crop is gonna be um, whatever it is, comma E for established. Then your second crop will be whatever it is, comma M for maintenance. And then if it's an already established crop, um, you would do M for both of them if you're not changing the crop. Um, and most of our pastures here in Alamance County in the Piedmont area are gonna be in this um, fescue category. Uh, so most are gonna be using the 055 code or 054, but if you are in Bermuda grass country, they've got codes for that, clover, sorghum, sudan. Um, it kind of lumps it with, is it a legume, is it a warm season, is it a cool season, that sort of thing. And if you forget everything I've said, it's all in the back of this form how to complete it. Okay, so talking about interpreting your soil test report, um, the soil test uh, is only going to test for the major nutrients. It's going to do um, phosphorus and potassium and it will do pH. It actually does not test for nitrogen because it leaches so quickly or it's taken up by the plant so quickly. Um, it gives you a base recommendation for nitrogen based on the crop that you list, but it will give you, um, it will give you a phosphorus index. So it'll tell you the level of phosphorus in the soil and a potassium index. And it'll also give you a pH range, which is super important. The recommendations are based on field experiments conducted in North Carolina. 
Um, so everything is, uh, is recommended for our soil and our um, land here in North Carolina. All right, so this is a soil test report um, so that you guys can like see an example of one. This is kind of a typical soil test report that I see where a pasture is active and has received chicken litter as fertilizer. Chicken litter is pretty common to um, come by. Well, I say that it's, it's common here, but you might have a hard time getting some of it because it's like gold. Um, but a lot of pastures do receive it. So this is kind of um, a typical report if it's received chicken litter. Most of our pastures, again, are fescue um, or cool season grasses. The very first thing that I take a look at is going to be the pH. So whenever you know you ask me to look at your report, this is kind of how I, I go through it. Um, I'm going to take a look at the pH, and what we really want to see is a six to a six five for most of our forages. So this one is a six one, so everything's good there, and it does not need any lime. Um, and how you kind of read this report, here's the sample ID right here, 01. Here's the recommendations. It's going to be nutrients, pounds per acre, and lime would be tons per acre right up here. And you can see that this um, report was for fescue M, and they had put it on both of the lines. Sometimes they record that and sometimes they don't, but um, nonetheless, so here's the baseline recommendation for nitrogen. Um, this will be the recommendation for phosphorus, for potassium, and then um, these are going to be the values that we're looking at, the test result units, and um, so I'm going to go through that here in just a second. Um, so next, I'm going to look at your phosphorus index, so that's the P-I, and this is 145, so you're probably thinking, well, what the heck does that mean? Um, there's an index and nutrient status uh, chart that we go by. So zero to 10 is a very low. It means if you applied phosphorus, if your index came back and it was a zero to a 10, if you applied phosphorus, the plant uptake will be very high. It would be very responsive. Um, you would see immediate results. 11 to 25 is low. Plant response will be high. 26 to 50 is medium. So again, plant response will be about medium on that. 51 to 100 is considered high, so you would have low to no plant response. Um, and 100 plus is considered very high, and there will be no plant response. So in this situation, with it being 145, my recommendation is no phosphorus because there's plenty of it available. If you were to apply it, you would um, A, be wasting money, and B, it could be an environmental hazard because it could run off because it's not being taken up. Um, so you don't want to put out anything excessive if there is no need there. Okay, um, so a little bit about phosphorus. It is important in helping plants um, manufacture food by using sunlight as a source of energy. It's um, needed for seed and fruit formation, proper root growth, and it increases the survival and the growth of the seedlings. Um, it usually does not leach from the soil, but it, it still can. It can more so run off. Um, so once it's there, it can be available for plant growth for years to come. So I will say that while nitrogen will leach and kind of leave in a hurry, Phosphorus does stick um, once it is into the soil. Um, it'll be there for a while. So once your levels get up there, you might not need to apply phosphorus to your pastures for several years. Um, I honestly, like our farm, we use chicken litter on our farm. And it has, I don't even know the last time we put out phosphorus or potassium for that matter because our levels are up there um, in that probably medium to high range and they've been like that uh, for a long time because it does phosphorus and potassium do stick around a lot longer than nitrogen. I will say that even though the soil test results do not test for um, nitrogen, um, you have to know that there is nitrogen available in the soil because it is pulled and fixated from the air. So there is some available, it's just they do not test for it to measure for it. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to look at is the potassium index. So this is definitely needed by plants in really large amounts. It's essential for a healthy forage stand. It often gets overlooked. I can't tell you how, um, you know, how 
how much this gets overlooked. Everybody's concerned about nitrogen most of the time, but this is really important. Um, it's needed for energy production, cold hardiness, root growth, drought tolerance, and to increase forage yields. It also helps the plant fight off disease and encourages um, more efficient nitrogen use by the plants. So what it does is it decreases the susceptibility to several plant diseases, which is important. Um, the potassium index here is a 44. So looking back at my chart, that's gonna fall into that medium range. Um, and it's not that far from high. So the recommendation would be to apply a minimal amount, like 50 pounds of potassium per acre. Um, and so that's right here um, where your recommendations are. Okay, so let's look at, again, I talked about pH. So because the pH is a 6-1, you don't need any lime, but this particular field would be on your radar. You know, you would definitely want to keep, um, uh, keep in touch with it because when that pH starts to drop down to the fives, you would then look to, to add lime to raise the pH up. And I will tell you, if the pH is not correct, all these other nutrients are, are not going to be available to the plant. So that's how the pH works. Um, if it's too low, you know, the plant might not be able to take up phosphorus and potassium like it normally would or nitrogen. You definitely don't want it too high either. It's like a sweet spot of this six to six five that we're looking for. Okay, so the nitrogen recommendation is 120 to 200 pounds of N per acre. Um, this is probably more appropriate for a hay crop, and that's kind of where this is a little faulty. You've got to apply it to your particular situation. Um, uh, nitrogen fertilization rates for grazing systems may be reduced 25 to 50 percent because you have nutrient recycling. So if you think about it, the animals are urinating and they are pooping out on the pasture and so they are recycling nutrients where hay crops do not. You're doing a total nutrient removal. Um, so the end recommendation for this farm is going to be determined based on the current forage production. If the forage production is high and the livestock cannot keep up with the growth, I would say little to no nitrogen. Um, there's no sense in boosting the forage if you do not need it. However, if you need an increase in forage production, I would recommend like 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre with half being applied in the fall and half in the spring since this is a cool pasture system. Um, I feel like for most pastures, folks hang out around that 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre to boost during the growth growing season. So if it's cool season, that's spring and fall. If it's warm season, that's going to be kind of on the front end of summer um, or the tail end of spring or so to get that forage boosted up. Um, and you also got to think, you know, do you have animals that are currently overweight? Um, are you having management issues with them anyways? Are they easy keepers? Again, you don't want to boost forage in those type of situations. Um, so just kind of a, a baseline recommendation for this particular situation, I would recommend applying potash. So a lot of times you have to, you might not be able to find a fertilizer that's going to do everything in one, um, what I'd call complete fertilizer, like what 10, 10, 10 is. Um, so for, for this, whenever you go and meet with somebody about fertilizer, they're probably going to, have to blend several together. So you would look at probably blending some potash at, at, if at the ratio is 0, 0, 060 on potash. So that would be about 83 pounds per acre. And if nitrogen was needed, maybe you could do 147 pounds per acre of ammonia nitrate, which is 3400. 0, 0. And this will give the producer 50 pounds of potassium and 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, and so that is that ratio, those numbers, 10, 10, 10, or whatever it might be, that's per 100 pounds. Um, so if you're not familiar with that. And if you are in Alamance County and you don't have... Um, my pasture resources guide, please let me know in the chat window. And if enough people need it, I'll definitely put it in the handouts folder. But most of the folks, if, if you're an Alamance and you came to any of my classes, you probably have it by now. But if you need it, or if you're on a borderline county and you need to know where to get fertilizer, lime from, or any pasture um, type services, just let me know in that chat window. 
Okay, so again, here's, um, I've highlighted where they put uh, the recommendations. Okay, so let's talk about forage selection. So that's kind of everything on soil testing and how you go about doing that. And one other last plug I'll put, it's always a good idea to bring your soil sample with you and you go talk to whoever's going to um, supply your fertilizer and you know show that to them and then if you get my recommendations or an extension agents recommendations bring that info with you as well and a lot's going to boil down to cost and they will try to work with you as much as possible to figure out how can they best meet these needs and also stay within your budget and um, they know what they have in stock we give recommendations but um, there's a lot of different scenarios as to how they can mix it and um, so definitely have a good conversation with them. And some are willing to work with small acreage folks, which is really, really nice. Uh, they might put together several small acreage farms in one route that need similar fertilizer or something like that. Or they might be willing to fill bags for you with ag fertilizer or barrels or something for you to spread on your own if you have just a few acres. So definitely reach out and get to know those, uh, those places, those stores. Okay, so on forage uh, selection, you definitely can get lost in this. There's a lot of different types of forages out there. You want to definitely match forage to your acreage, uh, the time and equipment that you, that you have, cost, um, what species you're raising and what you're trying to accomplish because you definitely can go overboard. Um, a lot of times you don't need as much as you think you do and a lot of people get sucked into buying stuff that they don't need and end up spending too much money and things like that so we're going to talk about it um cool season versus warm seasons annuals versus perennials and if you're curious um, my photo here is um some goats grazing forage chicory which is a perennial warm season and i a lot of my photos in this slideshow are from dr heather glennon she used to work for NC State. She's now at um, the University of Mount Olive. And if you're following along with our goat and sheep uh, webinar series, she'll be our guest speaker on grazing next week. So we're excited to have her, but she has the most beautiful photos. <laughs> so I asked her if I could use her photos. Um, okay. So some forage selection terms, you might be wondering like, well, what does she mean when she says cool season or warm season? And what's the definition of that? So cool season, they're going to grow best uh, from 40 degrees to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Warm season's above 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So right now in Alamance County, we our cool seasons are doing really, really well. And our warm seasons are kind of peeking through, trying to see what they want to do, but our temperatures have kind of kept them at bay. I know on our farm, um, and I'll show some pictures and talk about it later, but our crabgrass has already germinated, but it's just kind of hanging out because it's not ready for it. We've had some warm days, but it's not consistent yet, and our night temperatures have been getting cooler. But it's been great for fescue, so everything comes in time. Um, an annual is going to complete its growth cycle in one growing season. So an annual forage, you're going to plant it, it's going to get up and grow in a hurry. It'll go to seed in a hurry. You got to stay on top of it like you wouldn't believe. A perennial, and if I had a comparison, I would say an annual is like a sprint runner and a perennial is like a marathon runner. Um, a perennial is going to come back year after year. It's definitely, I think, the best bang for your buck on a lot of livestock systems. Annuals have their place and they can be super helpful, but I think the majority of your, your pasture needs to be perennials. So you don't have to constantly plant, you don't have constant cost on seed and time and all that stuff, um, but it comes back year after year from its roots. So this is kind of the uh, growth pattern for cool season. So this is starting with February and ending with January, but it starts to peak and it is going, it's definitely like at its peak right now going into it, that April, May timeframe. And then um, it is going to slump something hard in the summertime. It's still living, like our fescue is still alive. Um, and then it'll do about half the production in the fall. And then again, it's still living in the winter time. So that's why it's so important not to leave animals on a fescue pasture over winter 
when it's still alive but not really growing, they will eat it into the dirt. And then it has a super hard time coming up and growing in the spring. So stop grazing at three to four inches, pull them off, put them in a sacrifice or a dry lot, feed them hay over the winter if you do not have a winter annual or stockpiled fescue to graze. Um, if you add in warm seasons on your farm, so I typically recommend like 75% of your farm in cool seasons here in Alamance County and 25% in warm season. I definitely think you get a lot of bang for your buck having mainly cool season here, um, mainly fescue. And then adding some warm season will give those animals a break and also give those pastures a break in the summertime. But it fills that summertime gap. As fescue's going down, your warm season, such as crabgrass, is going up and it fills that summer gap and animals can continue to thrive and gain and do really, really well. So when you combine them both, you get kind of an optimal system. But if you are operating on really small acreage, it can be hard to have dedicated um, acreage to both warm and cool season. And they really don't need to be mixed together per se. Um, the only one that could be is if you're doing Bermuda grass or something that goes dormant, it's a perennial goes dormant in the winter, like Bermuda grass, you can interseed a winter annual, but you cannot do a warm season perennial and a cool season perennial. Like you, I wouldn't recommend putting Bermuda grass and fescue because fescue is trying to live year round. That Bermuda grass is going to choke it out come the summertime. And that's a problem. So um, you would have dedicated space for each. Now there's certain compatible species that you can put in with them together. And we'll talk about that. Um, we'll actually talk about on the next slide. So you kind of see, this isn't an exhaustive list by any means. This is kind of a more popular list, but your cool season grasses, your perennials are your tall fescue, orchard grass, bluegrass, perennial ryegrass. I would say that out of all these, you know, again, fescue, whether it's Kentucky 31 or novel endophyte fescue, it just does really well uh, here in the Piedmont area. Um, and orchard grass, usually cannot withstand a lot of grazing. It has to be babied quite a bit. You'll see some volunteer. And um, if you're a really good grazing manager, you could probably have it in your pastures planted, but it's a compatible species to tall fescue because they're both cool season perennials. You'll see volunteer bluegrass, volunteer ryegrass sometimes in your pastures um, as well. So most of the time, even if you have a fescue pasture, I can walk out there and I can probably find all of these species, even if you didn't plant them. So they do volunteer, they do come in and give some diversification to that pasture. Um, let's see, so as far as annual cool seasons, you've got rye grass and you've got small grains like rye and wheat, oats, things like that. Um, when, when we talk about our warm season grasses, our perennials are Bermuda grass, Dallas grass, switchgrass, blue, big blue stem, chicory. Um, switchgrass and big blue stem are native warm seasons. They are really awesome, but really hard to get established. And so don't hang, get hung up on the word native. <laughs> I don't really see them you know, as uh, a volunteer native species around. And I think the main reason is they like to be really tall and you have to graze them very differently than what we're used to. And I think if when they come into most pastures are grazed out because we tend to let our animals graze um, a lot lower than those species like. When I say they like to be grazed tall, usually you don't start grazing them till they're probably 12 inches or more. And then you stop probably around eight inches. Whereas with fescue, you start at six to eight inches and you stop at three to four. So you can kind of see how, you know, that it would just get selected out. But, you know, if you can go through the process of getting them established, which usually takes a couple years to do, they're definitely great to have for summer species. Um, I would say that in North Carolina, there's a lot of Bermuda grass. Um, that's out there as a warm season perennial. Dallas grass volunteers, I can find it in every pasture I ever walk into. Um, I've never heard of anybody seeding it. I know that it can be done. I think it's hard to come by, but it's it volunteers easy here. 
Our annuals are so, stuff like pearl millet, sorghum Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan hybrids, crabgrass, brassicas. Crabgrass is one that definitely can out like a perennial, which is super cool. You can plant it as an annual, and um, if you let it go to seed late in the season, like August, September, and let it drop seed, you can put the animals through, and they'll kind of help to put the seed down into the ground, um, and then you disturb the ground the following year, it usually comes back. So I've seeded a whole bunch of crabgrass, but I've also worked with it to see if it'll come back and it, it does well in both situations. You can seed it because it doesn't take a lot of seed per acre um, and you just do it for insurance or you can try to get it to come back by letting it drop seed. Perennial legumes, you've got white and red clover, alfalfa, lespedeza, vetch, annual legumes, crimson clover, hairy vetch peas. These are great compatible species um, with whatever season you're going with. So like if you want to have a fescue pasture but you want to dilute it a little bit and boost protein um, and digestibility, I would recommend tall fescue with like a white or ladino clover. Red clover is typically done in hay production versus grazing. That white or that ladano clover usually does better for grazing. Um, as far as when it comes to choosing a seed variety, it's best to talk with um, the seed supplier to figure out you know, what variety has been proven for your area. Don't just get on the internet and go buy some seed from like Oregon or something like that without knowing has it been planted and put on trial here in North Carolina. So NC State does a lot of forage uh, work, but a lot of the companies do do work as well. And they usually work with the university. So that's kind of how a lot of that's done. But um, just talk to them and figure out, well, what's planted in my area. And if you're not certain, just reach out to Extension. We'll be happy to talk you through all that. But some like common varieties of fescue, the one that you can just go pick up anywhere is Kentucky 31. That's mainly what all our pastures are. But if you want to improve variety that's a novel end of fight without the fescue toxicosis issues, um, Max Q Bar Optima, uh, Max Q or Bar Optima are two varieties that are out there. Orchard grass, um, the varieties that are that I see quite a bit are persist and benchmark. Bermuda grass, Cheyenne too, I know has been planted quite a bit here. And that's just a tip of the iceberg. There's tons of varieties out there. Um, oh, and mixes. So mixes have become popular in the past few years to add um, you know, diversity and to also build soil health, which is super important. So having different types of root structures, you know, tap roots and um, fibrous roots and things like that. Also legumes and grasses, you know, legumes can fix nitrogen. Um, and there's some that have tubers that can also help if you've got some compaction issues. And then you also have a lot of different forage variety, which animals really enjoy. They love having some variety, especially goats and sheep. They are not gonna love a fescue pasture, and I'll get to that here in a minute. They're gonna want some variety. You just gotta make sure it's compatible. So Ray's Crazy Mix is one. They have a summer mix and they have a fall mix. So if you're into annuals or you're wanting to build soil health or transition your field, um, or just play with it in a small area. That's a really cool one that has a lot of different seed in it. Um, I think it even has like sunflower, has all these different things in it. Um, so look into that. And you can also make your own mixes as again, as long as it's compatible. Um, and one last thing, be careful when you choose pasture blends. Um, I hear this all the time. You know, I went to the feed store and I picked up this pasture blend and, you know, I have went around to the feed stores and looked at a lot of these pasture blends and a lot of them include um, species that don't do well here or aren't meant for pastures here. An example is Timothy. Timothy is can be grown as an annual crop in like the mountains here in North Carolina. It's technically a perennial, but they can't, we can't get it to really work like one down here. It is something that's grown up north in a lot cooler climate. So that's just kind of a waste. Um, I, you're not gonna find it in pastures here. Um, so stuff like that, be careful when you're buying those pasture blends. So I ran across this study that was done in 2006 
And of course, when I ran across it, I forgot to write down who did it. So I don't know and I can't figure it out. <laughs> it was a university. I just can't figure out who it was. They did this whole study on ranking um, the palatability of forages with I believe they did it with goats, but it might have been goats and sheep or just small ruins in general. But this is ranked from most to least palatable, most is sorghum Sudan, least is Bermuda grass. So you can kind of look at this list. It's very interesting where things fall and I could have guessed on quite a bit of it. Um, but they definitely just don't care a whole lot for fescue, bluegrass, Bermuda grass, basically the stuff that grows pretty well in North Carolina. Um, and then when you start moving up the list, you know, you see orchard grass. Orchard grass is so palatable. Um, all the species love orchard grass. Canary grass, then your native warm seasons fall in there. Of course, alfalfa. Oat grass is not really something here. Um, so that's in some different states. So you can kind of X that one out. But Lespedeza is definitely very palatable. Chicory, and then you get into your clovers, which, you know, is a give me. Turnips and sorghum Sudan. You do have to be very careful with um, forages in the sorghum family because of the prussic acid issues. Um, so I don't know why per pearl millet's not on here. Maybe they didn't use it in the trial, but pearl millet is a, is a summer annual that I would probably recommend over anything in the sorghum family just because of the prussic acid issue, which can come out if we have drought conditions, um, it comes out with frost. It's anytime it's real stressed and you just have to be very careful grazing it and extension can give guidance on that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about tall fescue. I mean, I've mentioned it quite a bit, but I want to talk about the fescue toxicosis issue. Um, so I think I've already mentioned everything on the slide there, but uh, about the fescue toxicosis. It is um, a fungus in the fescue that makes it super hardy and it makes it um, able to persist really well in our environment here. But because of that, it does cause a problem for livestock. So I'm gonna kind of go through what that looks like for the different species. For cattle, I feel like it affects cattle and probably horses more than any other species. But cattle have poor weight gains on it. They'll produce less milk. They'll have a really high internal body temperature higher respiratory rate, um, they'll retain a rough hair coat, they'll appear unthrifty, poor reproductive performance. It's so hard to breed cattle on fescue in the summertime. Let me, you know, in, in, in certain times of the year. So you can breed them on fescue in the fall, in the winter time, early spring. It's just more so when that plant is really stressed, which is in the summertime. Um, they can lose blood flow to their extremities. And um, so you probably heard about uh, fescue foot. Um, you may have seen where tail switches will come off. Um, I actually had a producer call me saying that they were finding tail switches in their pasture. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I was thinking a predator or something like that. The more we got to talking, they had turned out their entire cow herd on a fescue field that had seeded out in the summertime because they got behind on mowing hay. And they were like, well, we don't want to waste it. We'll just turn the cows out. So the toxins live in the base of the plant, they, but they shoot up to the seed heads whenever, whenever it seeds out. So those cows were consuming a lot of toxins and they were losing blood flow to their extremities. Um, so they were losing their tail switches. So my recommendation is to definitely mow off those seed heads if the grass gets away from you and seeds out. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But on horses, particularly brood mares, they'll have late term abortion, stillborn, stillborn foals, prolonged gestation periods, and dystocia, thickened or retained placentas, poor conception rates, and problems with the foals if they're born alive. So if you're breeding horses, you want to pull them off um, while they're bred. You want to pull them off of fescue and you want to feed them, um, you know, either legume or orchard grass, anything but fescue, just so you don't have any of these issues um, down the road with them. With sheep, what I have found is they appear to be less effective, but they're still prone to fescue foot. Poor wool production, so if you're into wool breeds, um, that can be an issue. They can have reproductive problems and also poor weight gains. Um, be mindful if you're trying to grow out lambs in the summer that you're not gonna be able to do that really well on fescue alone. Like you've got to have a game plan for some summer grazing. 
goats, little is known about fescue toxicosis in goats. They're very selective um, and they will avoid fescue if at all possible, which if you have goats, you know this about goats. <laughs> They're so selective. Um, they also have the ability to uh, rapidly eliminate plant metabolic chemicals from their body. Um, and uh, it's been shown to have reduced weight gains. Um, that's been shown in research studies with goats. So fescue's here to stay. And unless you want to make a good plan to switch over to novel and to fight fescue, which is so much easier to do if you're starting from bare ground versus a Kentucky 31 pasture is trying to convert, but I myself or anybody in extension can talk you through that. But how you can live with fescue if you already have it, um, plant diversity, make sure that you have other compatible species, you know, add in clover or something like that uh, to just help diversify those species. Supplementation, you can supplement them, you know, with protein or energy. Um, while they're on fescue and that will kind of help you supplement them with a different type of hay and that will help mowing the pastures or seed head suppression so there is a herbicide out there um the chemicals met sulfuron it will actually if you spray it it'll keep the grass from seed now you just cannot do it year after year you have to do it in rotation but if you mow the seed heads off, this promotes the plant back to vegetative growth, which is really important. Uh, when the grass seeds out, it actually stops putting out leaf and it loses protein in a hurry. So if you clip the seed heads, it puts it back in a vegetative state and increases the nutritional value. Um, it also helps the weed control because the grass is back growing and it'll prevent pink eye or any kind of eye issues. Pink eyes definitely I feel like more of an issue with cattle around here but you can still if seed heads are slapping them in the eye it'll open them up to infection having eye problems uh, always provide minerals free choice minerals on pasture and water and shade water and shade will help with heat stress if they're experiencing that Okay, so let's talk about forage selection um, and kind of how you go about the process of selecting what's going to work for you um, when we talk about the current situation, I mean, is the land being converted from woods to pasture land? Um, you might, if that is your situation, you probably want to consider annuals to begin with until your soil is amen amended and your nutrients have been added and your pH has um, uh, came up because uh, land that's been in trees, the pH is going to be low, the nutrients are going to be low, and you can't do that overnight. Um, it's going to take probably a year or two to get it right, and so using annuals to fill in that gap, not only will the annuals add organic matter and they'll start working on your soil health, um, they usually are, some of them are pretty forgiv forgiving if there's not a correct pH or correct soil nutrients or things like that. Um, so we've been using, I know on our farm, crabgrass, um, whenever we're doing, going from woods to pasture to buy some time on getting the soil the way we want it before we put in a perennial and it's worked really well, but a lot of the annuals will work in that situation. They just might not be as productive as they would be if your pH was higher, you had nutrients, but it's more about keeping the ground covered while you're trying to get this all done and hopefully provide a little bit of grazing. Um, if the land's being renovated or weeds have taken it over or something like that, you uh, can make forage decisions for the short term until you can plant for the long term. If you have a major weed invasion, you can actually, if you want to kind of avoid spraying a whole lot, you could plant annuals that get tall that can smother out the weeds. And then you can, after that, um, you can then plant some more of the desirable species that you want. So there's ways to work annuals to your advantage while you're renovating or switching forage species or something like that. It's kind of an in-between a lot, or it can be used to fill a forage gap. For acreage, if you have smaller acreage, you're going to want to consider a cool season perennial if you're here. If you're down east, it would be kind of the opposite. You would want that warm season perennial such as a Bermuda grass base. Um, farms with larger acreage, again, you know, 25% warm season, 75% cool season. 
management. Um, some species you have to manage more carefully because they cannot tolerate um, low nutrient levels, overgrazing, weed pressure, etc. Um, so if you are a really good grazing manager and you know you're moving your animals and you're watching the height of the forage you can definitely do a lot more of these forages if you work all the time and you kind of get behind on farm chores and you're not able to keep up with things like you would want to, then you've got to take that into account whenever you pick your forages. Something that's super sensitive like orchard grass, you would want to stay away from because it's sensitive to grazing, it's sensitive to nutrients and things like that. Um, and if you're also not on top of your weeds, <laughs> <laughs> that's also something to consider. Some of these don't do well competing against um, weeds and things like that. Time and equipment. If you work off the farm full time and have limited equipment, a perennial system is going to work better for you. So you don't have to try to figure out how to plant pastures all the time. Um, planting annuals does require time and equipment. You can get by with minimal equipment. I'll show some examples here in a little bit, but uh, nonetheless, you still have to be available when that crop needs to go in the ground. Um, so if you're just like super slammed, you know, during these planting windows with other things, then again, that's not going to be for you. And a perennial that just keeps on, you know, chugging along and all you got to do is look at it every once in a while, maybe add some fertilizer and lime, that might be a better situation. These annuals are a little bit more tricky to manage because you got to put them in, keep the animals off, wait till it's at the appropriate time to graze. You might have to um, apply fertilizer at a, a different time and things like that. Cost is definitely a huge one. Um, if you're wanting to keep your costs really minimal, some of these improved varieties can get quite expensive and annuals can get quite expensive if you're putting in annuals all the time. So consider that uh, perennials are a long-term investment. So while there may be costs associated, you have to then span it out over, you know, will that stand last you five years, 10 years, you know, that sort of thing. Um, species and goals, again, if you have brood mares, um, which I know you guys are goat and sheep folks, but you would want to consider, you know, maybe a novel endophyte fescue so you don't have to worry about Kentucky 31 fescue. If you are, again, like finishing grass, finishing lambs or kids, um, and you're trying to do that in the summertime, if you're, you know, if they're being born in the spring and you're trying to finish them through the summer, you want to have a summer grass available for sure. Um, you don't want to try to do that on fescue. They're just not going to perform and gain as well. Um, uh, trying to think if there's anything else. I think a lot of it's just thinking through what you're trying to do with your animals, where you are um, with your management, what's your budget, and that's kind of where you go from there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about establishment. So there's conventional seed bed preparation steps, um, and this is a uh, this is definitely one of those things that it's situation specific. I'm more than likely not going to tell you to, to go out and plow an already established pasture. We'll try to figure it out while keeping the sod in place. But if you're going from trees to pasture, that's kind of where this conventional seedbed prep will usually come into play. Or if you just got a major catastrophe and you need to kill off everything and start literally from the ground zero, meaning, you know, you've got to get rid of all your Kentucky 31 or you have weeds taking over everything, stuff like that. So step one is going to be to um, clear the land, clean up the land or spray the vegetation. Um, and so you will want to, um, with that step one, you would definitely want to graze or mow that grass really, really low before you start doing all this. Um, and then you would, um, spray any regrowth with a non-selective herbicide such as glyphosate if you're wanting to kill off everything before you get started. So soil sampling is going to be very important so that you know your lime and fertilizer needs um, and to give yourself time to amend the soil and get it ready um, in order to plant. 
Step two is going to be liming. Um, so you want to inc incorporate the lime as early as possible, ideally six to 12 months ahead of planting. It takes a long time to get down into the soil and to become available for the plant. Step three, you want to prepare the soil um, by plowing, disking, and then allow time for the soil to settle or use a cultipacker roller to firm the seed bed. This is so important. You definitely don't want the soil to be too fluffy. Um, it'll be hard for the seed to take root and grow in that situation. Um, and you want to incorporate fertilizer and any remaining lime in this stage. Lastly, the step four is to drill or broadcast the seed. So with um, open soil like that, you can do either method. Um, and it really depends on what you're seeding. Some seed is really small and um, you know might not do as well in a drill or might not do as well in um, you know a spreader so you have to have to look at what you're trying to seed and what's the preferred method of seeding if you broadcast you want to make sure that you increase your seeding rate because some of it will wash away some of it won't take that sort of thing but you want to make sure it makes good seed to soil contact so it definitely will in this situation there's a lot of bare ground but you might need to go over it with a cultipacker to kind of mash it into the ground a little bit. Um, with the drill, you want to make sure you do not drill the seed too deep. You should be able to walk behind the drill for a lot of these grasses. They only need to go like a quarter um, to a half an inch in the ground. You should be able to walk behind it and find seed on the ground. If you don't, you might have planted too deep. So there's a footprint. When you walk across it after it's packed, uh, you really don't want your footprint any deeper than this right here. If it's if it's deeper than that, I know I've got a measurement. Yeah, boot tracks should be a quarter of an inch deep. So if it's deeper than that, your soil's too fluffy and you need to either let a good rainfall pack it or drag something over and pack it. For no-till prep, you're, you're going to want to do the same thing in the beginning. Take your soil samples and make adjustments as needed. Mow or graze the grass close or apply non-selective herbicide, again, like glyphosate. Um, and then you're going to, uh, in that third step, you're going to drill your seed. And in some cases, you can broadcast if there's enough bare ground um, that it'll have good seed to soil contact. And... Um, this is really great for overseeding. So say you have a pretty good established pasture, but you notice there's quite a bit of bare ground, um, you know, in spots and things like that. This keeps your existing sod in place. So you can see the drill down here. This is actually Alamance County soil and water drill that you can rent um, here in Alamance County. And I think it can be rented out of county as well, just for a higher fee. But um, this is really awesome. What it does is it basically cuts a slit into the ground. It drops a seed through the little seed tubes right here. It has a, a, a big box on it and a small box. So that's for the different seed sizes. And it's going to drop the seed down. Then it has this press wheel that presses um, the soil, presses the seed to the soil so there's good contact. Um, so seed drills are really expensive. Most uh, livestock farms do not have them. However, most counties have them available for rent and they are fabulous and they're very affordable to rent as long as you've got a tractor to pull it or can borrow a tractor to pull it um, i highly recommend it there's there's only a few situations where you really need to totally tear up your pasture um, we really want to keep sod on these pastures while we're working on them so we prevent runoff or any kind of erosion type issues um, <coughs> so i talked about you know, working with what you have. Um, this is actually a setup uh, photo borrowed from um, Brad Moore, who's in Soil and Water in Alamance County. He put this together so he'd only have to go over the pasture one time, and I love it. I use it all the time as an example. <coughs> if you do not have a no-till drill, but you've got access to some old equipment, this is an example. Um, so he has this little disker behind there and it's basically cutting open the, a slit of ground. Then he's got a, um, a drill right here, but it's not a no-till drill. So it's just a conventional drill. So it's just going to drop the seed. And then he's got tires back here and that's what packs it into the ground. So essentially he's made a no-till drill. <laughs> um, and I love it. I think it's great. This is stuff he had you know, available to him and he hooked it all together and it works 
wonderfully. So look around, see what you got, see what your neighbors got available and you can make some stuff happen. But you can see he mowed off this field. You definitely want to mow it or graze it down to do any of this so that the seed can easily get down to the ground. I've got some pictures here. This is a max Q fescue no-till um, drill that was done or using a no-till drill. So you can see the rows. What I recommend for pastures, if you're doing this from bare ground, so this one was from bare ground. This is actually a sheep farm that planted this. This is a novel endophyte. So again, novel endophyte means that that bad fungus has been replaced with a friendly one um, or that the bad endophyte has been replaced with a friendly endophyte. And so all that fescue toxicosis stuff goes away. It also is more palatable um, to the animals and they perform really well on it. However, it takes an upper level of management to do novel endophyte because of the fact that that really hardy endophyte is now gone. Um, I will say they've improved a lot with novel endophytes and they're doing a whole lot better now. They're on like the second and third generation, I think of, of breeding um, those plants. So, but you can see the rows, okay? The issue with that is, uh, you know, that there's still a lot of bare ground, could allow weeds and things like that. I recommend doing a crisscross pattern. So go rows one way. If you're doing this from bare ground, if you're overseeding, it's fine just to make one pass through, but then crisscross it so that you're adding more plants into that population and minimizing how much bare ground is still out there. Um, this field did still have some residue on the ground, which is really nice. Again, organic matter helped do some weed suppression, that sort of thing. So this field was sprayed with a non-selective herbicide um, and all that was allowed to just kind of compost down into the ground and then they planted. Okay, um, I did a, uh, a pasture class back in, I wanna say it was 2018 now, and we did two different ones and we based it around, you know, using the drill and because we just gotten the drill and soil and water. And then also talking about crabgrass and we did two different little trials. We did crabgrass in a prepared seed bed area that um, was where cows are being fed hay. So a sacrifice area can go same with sheep and goats. And then we put in um, crabgrass in an area where there was just like thin fescue. And we did that with a no-till drill since there was exist existing sod. And so these pictures show the progression of the prepared seed bed area. Crabgrass does like a prepared seed bed with like usually right after a lot of disturbance like a sacrifice or a hay feeding area it is phenomenal to put in those situations because it comes up quickly it'll also provide grazing it'll compete with weeds um, i basically took a sacrifice lot on our farm that was just weed city i mean it had every weed in the book and by using crabgrass every single year it is now a super productive field even though it's still used as a sacrifice lot we only spray it for buttercups and that's it. And it is now just a really productive. It still has some fescue in it, but it's mainly comes back with crabgrass. Um, so here's that, that blank slate after feed and hay. You can see where the crabgrass is coming up. And then this is what it looked like in August. So, I mean, it rolls pretty quickly. You usually can get two to three grazings out of it um, before it kind of seeds out and starts to play out in the fall. Um, and usually you want to plant crabgrass the end of April, beginning of May time frame. That's usually a good time to get it in. However, you can plant it much later than that. You're just not going to get as much grazing out of it. When you, a little bit about crabgrass for those that might be interested, um, and there are improved varieties of crabgrass. So I'm not talking about your front yard crabgrass. Um, there are improved varieties such as Quick and Big and Red River that's out there sold through our local seed companies but you can also purchase online um, as well. But check with those local companies first to see if that they can get it to save you on shipping. But um, because the seed is so light and fluffy and pretty small, and you only need like five to six pounds per acre in most situations, 
um, it's hard to put that small of amount out over an acre and then it also doesn't sling very far. So what I recommend is, um, and it does broadcast really well, you just have to do this. You want to mix it with a pelleted lime. Um, I've heard some people mixing it with sand or other carrying agents. Pelleted lime works really well and it's super cheap and it also benefits the pasture a tiny bit. <laughs> so I'm all for it. But this is what it looks like um, mixing it together and, and putting that out on the pasture. It will go okay in the drill in that pasture workshop that I talked about here. It definitely did better broadcast on the prepared seed bed. It did come up with the no-till drill, but it didn't do as well. And some of that, I feel like, um, was just the situation we put it in. Um, but I don't know. I, I've always broadcasted and had really good luck with that. This is some orchard grass and clover that was planted, I believe, for a hay crop. This is a summer annuals with a no-till drill. I think this was pearl millet. Um, so you can see that. That is some really good palatable stuff right there, especially for sheep and goats. Um, planting dates for common forages. So um, you definitely want to make sure that you do not try to plant fescue in the spring um, or any of our cool season perennials, fescue orchard grass, because it um, doesn't have time to grow the roots that it needs in order to make it through our hot, dry summer. So a lot of it will die. Um, so you want to make sure you wait till the fall. Hardly ever can we plant in August. So it's more like September, October. But you would plant in the fall and you would pull the animals from it. And, you know, it would have all winter to grow roots. It's barely going to grow any kind of top growth. It's going to work on growing roots. Again, think about a marathon. It takes a long time. And by the spring, you should be able to lightly graze it, you know, six months later, but it's not going to be in full blown production probably for a whole year. So you got to keep that in mind when you're planning or renovating. Don't do all your pastures at once, kind of rotate them so you are not having to dry a lot and feed animals throughout that whole time if you can. Uh, rye grass, August 20 through October 31st. Small grains like oats, wheat, rye, August 20 through October 3rd. Again, Rarely do we have the right temperature and soil moisture in August, so it's usually September, October. Summer annuals go in the ground about now, um, so April 25th to June 30th. You really want that, you want to be grazing in June, so I suggest you go on the front side or the early side um, once we start tracking with warmer temperatures. So we're like teetering right now and it's about to start happening. Bermuda grass will be April 1 to June 15th, and there are seeded varieties um, where you, I don't know how much y'all know about Bermuda grass, but you can sprig seed it or you can seed it by seed. And um, so there's two different ways to go about establishing that. And then clover is a little bit more flexible. You can do clover in the fall or you can do clover in what we call frost seeding um, time frame or on the later part of that window. And these dates are flexible. These are just kind of the recommended dates. Now I'm, I'm going to put in y'all's handouts the planting guide from North Carolina if you haven't seen that before. And I'll link you to our Forages website from NC State with a lot of info on there too. So again, um, a new pasture, do not expect to get on it earlier than 12 months if it's a perennial, okay? Annuals is a whole different ball game. Annuals are meant to graze quick, um, you know, and that sort of thing. But on these perennials, um, I would say 12 months if it's a bare bones deal. Overseeding, um, so if you already have sod out there and you're overseeding, you can get back on it in six months. And then 12 months will be when those plants mature. You can lightly graze at the six month mark if you're very, very careful <laughs> and you're a good manager. Um, but in most situations, you know, I would just like mow it and baby it because you want it for the long haul. Um, Especially if you do have some horses on your farm, they will pull stuff up by the roots. So you just have to be careful what species you do have. Goats and sheep and ruminants in general, um, the th cows are probably the most gentle on grass, but goats and sheep have lips and they can definitely be very selective and they can do a little bit of damage on a pasture. So you've gotta be careful. Um, okay. Top five causes of sand loss that I see. Poor fertilization practices, so not soil sampling, just doing whatever, um, not paying attention to potassium or things like that. Low soil pH, just 
not paying attention to it, you know, not um, soil samplings, you don't know what your pH is, you're not adding lime. If you've got broom sedge out in your pasture, that's an indicator species that either you have a low pH and or uh, low phosphorus. So there are some species and I'll walk out in a pasture if I see them and you don't have a soil sample, I can almost guarantee you that something's going on like that and nothing will eat that and you have to amend your soil to get that to go away. Um, frequent overgrazing or scalping with the mower. I can't tell you how many times I go to farms where they have front pastures, they want to look pretty, so they mow them with the lawnmower. It's definitely not our goal with pastures. You want that forage maintained at a higher um, level and you don't want to mow it like a pasture because what you're seeing on the top is what's going on underneath. So if you're constantly mowing it to two to three inches, that also mimics what overgrazing would do and the roots are only two to three inches long. So they're not gonna withstand much and they're gonna eventually go away. So the name of the game is, especially in these, um, depending on what you have, but let's just do cool seasons for example. For fescue, you wanna start grazing at six to eight inches and you wanna stop at three to four. Rotate, get them off, let the grass rest, let it come back and then you go back on it again. That allows it to have enough leaf to photosynthesize, um, to, to continue to grow good roots and to continue to persist and be a productive pasture for you. Lack of topsoil uh, rooting depth. So, you know, again, if you're inheriting a field um, that has a lot of compaction or something like that, you might wanna look to use some annuals to help break up compaction, to build some organic matter. Uh, think about soil health. We gotta feed what's in the ground before it's gonna feed our forages, before it's gonna feed our animals. So we're really soil grass managers before we're livestock producers. Um, and weed pressure is huge. So luckily with goats and sheep, sheep really like broad leaves. Goats really like browse. And so they both kind of have their good qualities. Sheep do graze a little bit better than goats, but it depends on what you have out there. Um, goats can graze really well too. But luckily they will go after some of this other stuff um, that's pretty palatable that we consider weed. So you shouldn't have a ton of weed pressure if you've got goats and sheep around. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. So let me go to the chat window and see if we got any questions in here. Um, I don't think we have any questions right now. If you, um, so I was just talking about the microphone. If you've got a question, go ahead and type that in the chat window and we'll do a little Q and A. Any questions about pastures, anything I discussed, uh, grazing. Um, okay, so Claire says, I'll be trying to establish pasture from mulched woods. Yep, soil sample, work on, um, you know, figuring out what kind of fertilizer and lime you're gonna need and start doing that. And then you want to make sure that you're clearing the area, filling in any holes, getting up stumps if you can, rocks, um, working on, on making things level. And then you wanna get something planted. So if that's happening right now, and say you want it to be a fescue pasture down the road, don't plant fescue look about doing a, some kind of a summer annual just to bridge the gap and if you can get your soil amended you know um, if it's not too bad you might can go ahead and get the fescue in this fall but if you still have a long window to go you might have to plant a winter annual and just continue to bridge the gap until you get to the right planting window when you know your ph is right and your soil nutrients are right but i'm gonna tell you it is it takes years. It takes probably two years on average for woods to pasture, but um, you might be looking at three for it to become real productive. So it's not going to happen overnight. Kennedy said, after the next harvest, I'm planning on converting a crop field into a fenced in pasture for cattle. I was just going to drill seed fescue, but if there's another species or something you recommend. Um, so a lot of would depend on where you're at, what your goals are, everything I discussed in this presentation, and then you would go from there on what your recommendation is. If you're here in Alamance County, 
for cattle, you're definitely gonna get the best bang for your buck with some fescue. If you're trying to do a grass finished beef operation, um, you're gonna wanna steer clear of Kentucky 31 and you're gonna wanna make sure that you've got um, some dedicated land to warm season um, forage production. So again, a lot just has to do with like what your goals are and that sort of thing. So feel free to email me um, on something like that. We can talk through it because it's going to be kind of a back and forth conversation. Michelle said fennel grass has been a weed. We are struggling with any ideas to control this without chemicals organically. I'm, so I'm thinking you're talking about dog fennel. Um, if you're talking about dog fennel, do you have sheep or goats that you are currently grazing? Feel free to um, unmute yourself. That'll probably be a little bit easier. Okay, you said just cows. Cows are not gonna eat dog fennel. I have witnessed, um, you know, our small ruminants eating it when it's young. So uh, dog fennel is definitely gonna be something that's hard to control without chemicals. Um, you can definitely, you can look at adding sheep or goats. Uh, that's one way to do it. The other way would be frequent mowing, but you will wear yourself out. Um, the third thing would be amending your soil and improving your pastures. So dog fennel is coming in for a reason. You know, is there bare ground? Um, is your is your grass being overgrazed? Is it a weakened stand? So if you focus on managing your grass and making sure there's no uh, bare soil and things like that, that'll also help keep the weeds back. Um, so hopefully that helps. If you still have questions about that, you know, feel free to, to ask me some more questions. Um, how do you feel about this new liquid lime? Um, I'm not a fan of some of these products that are getting pushed out on producers. Um, you got to read into it. Reach out to me if you got a specific one you're looking at. Every one I've investigated does not do the same thing that ag lime does for the money. Um, they promise you a lot and it's typically not going to work out um, the way the ag lime works out on a pasture. Okay, so what takes care of the broom straw? Again, um, it's usually a pH or phosphorus issue. That's the only thing that's gonna take care of it. Get your soil tested. Figure out, does your pH need to come up so you need to add lime or is it a phosphorus issue you would need to add phosphorus? And in some cases, it's both. That's the only thing that's gonna get rid of it. Um, no chemical, uh, no grazing, nothing like that. Mowing, um, it comes in in the fall and it's green and then it turns that golden color. Um, and so that's kind of when everybody notices it, but it, it is something going on with your pasture as far as nutrients or pH. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, thank y'all so much. I will definitely be sending you more information. Please complete my short evaluation. It definitely helps uh, justify these type of programs. And if you've got ideas for future programs, I'll be more than happy to address that um, hopefully in the future. Thank you and y'all have a great night.